tell you a story, I'm sure, well, I hope it's going to be of interest to you. And if not, the beers are on me tonight, so either way, you're not <laughs> So what's the story about? Uh, let me introduce you with Luke, who happens to be a FreeBSD developer as well, and who's got a brilliant idea to grow his own company. So what Luke wants to do is to build a network, a social network, a website to build this social network. But it's kind of revolutionary because instead of being able to send pictures or small text to friends, here you will be able to uh, send short audio messages to your network. So we believe it's a very good idea and he's been thinking about it for quite some time now. And even came up with the name Gurgle and nice logos based on an apples and birds. He thinks it's one of rock. And with those great ideas, he goes to see investors, and uh, investors believe it's going to do well as well, and he, they give him some money to grow his own company. And everything goes pretty well for quite some time. And one year later, we see that uh, Nuv has got a couple uh, hundred developers working at his company. And we also see that he tries to motivate them being creative. So, so far so good. And after some time, Nu uh, looks at the financial figures for his company. And at first, the figures uh, went up very well. But after some time, the figures dropped. And Nu realizes that uh, even if he had a nice idea at first, this company has troubles to find uh, innovation again and to be creative again. <coughs> and now the story starts to be interesting because you've got another character here, Mr. Wolf. I don't know if you remember Mr. Wolf, but you've seen him in a famous movie already. And in this famous movie, Mr. Wolf is the guy we call when we have issue and is the guy who fixes problems. So for the next 40 minutes, we're going to hear uh, Mr. Wolf explaining to you how to be more creative and how to sustain innovation in his company. Uh, Mr. Wolf is going to explain what kind of organizational culture uh, Nu must set up in his company to sustain innovation. And he's going to talk also about the structure which goes with the culture to sustain this innovation. And at the end, we're going to go back to FreeBSD because that's what interests us here. And we're going to answer uh, the question if whether or not we've, we've got the proper culture and the proper structure at FreeBSD to make people be creative and um, to make them have innovative ideas. So let's start first with the organizational culture. Yeah. And before uh, hearing what Mr. Wolf has to say to you with regards to the culture, we're going to uh, step back a while and just uh, try to answer what the culture within an organization. And I like this quote from Tierney, who says that an organization's culture is now is what determines how people behave when they are not being watched. And actually, the, the culture is a subject that's been extensively studied uh, in business schools. And uh, there's not a quote from Dylan Kennedy <coughs> saying that culture is the way we do things around here. So basically, culture refers to the attitudes, to the rituals, to the symbols, and to the values we find in organizations. And I don't know if you work for large organizations such as Google or others, but usually when you enter their building, you've got a large poster on the wall, and on those posters are listed the different values uh, that uh, arise within the company. And I've been working some time for uh, one of the big four consultancy firms, and we had stuff like we respect the individual, we act with integrity, those kind of values. But um, if you work at Google, maybe you have seen on the walls 
that uh, you can be serious without a suit, but that's the kind of value you find uh, on the walls of Google. And basic, basically, uh, those posters with values are a way for top manager to make uh, people behave the same way. Because uh, if we take the example, you can be serious without a suit, it would feel strange if you enter a Google building, if you go to work there uh, wearing a suit and a tie, people working there would look at you and would say, oh, he's not working for us, this guy. <laughs> so that's the kind of things that we find um, in large companies, those kind of core values, and that's part of the culture of company. And then, thinking about it, new uh, starts to wonder, okay, I don't have those posters on my walls, so what should I put on them so that it helps people being creative? So, we're going to see that the first yeah, advice from Mr. Wolf is that the core value to stress on at first is the empowerment of people. You must empower your workforce to make them creative. So what is empowerment? Uh, I like this model from, from Marchington, who draws a kind of staircase of empowerment because he says that there are different levels of empowerment. And you have very low empowerment in fast food chain restaurant, for example. If you work in such a restaurant, you are told what to do, how to greet people, how to make their hamburgers and stuff like that. Basically, you're not empowered at all. You don't have any uh, freedom um, with regards to how you must do your work. You are told everything you must do. So that's a very uh, low level of empowerment. And on the top of the staircase, you have control. Basically, um, your employees, uh, they are those who control the organization. And uh, they are uh, well, you would say that it does not really exist in real life, but I got an example uh, I found in the literature. Uh, Semco, it's the name of the company. It's a Brazilian company working in industry. They build machines. And there, it's very special. Um, I advise you to read this article from Semler. It's Semco CEO, and it's very interesting to see how people work there. Because employees at Senco, they are able to set their own wages. They are able to say how much they want to be paid. They are able to uh, say uh, who's going to be my manager, and they assess their manager. They are able, I don't know, when they go abroad on a business trip, they are able to say, I want to sit in business class, I want to go to this hotel. And really, they've got total freedom over how they want to organize their work and how they want to spend the money. Of course, there are drawbacks. They must explain where the money is spent. They must justify it and so on. But they've got this possibility. And surprisingly, it works very well because Senco is evolving in a very competitive <coughs> environment. And in this environment, they are able to um, earn more money than than their competitors, and they are doing very well. So that's the first advice from uh, Mr. Wolf. He wants to explain you that, um, you remember the picture in the trailer, the drawing? Uh, we saw uh, New saying that you must be creative, and he wants to force people to be creative, but it's not the way it works. Uh, actually, uh, you must give more freedom to your employees and it's what we're gonna say, we're gonna see in the following slide. And yeah, thinking about empowerment, uh, Mr. Lu, he remembers that when he works at FreeBSD, actually, uh, the developers, they are empowered because they are able to choose on which topic they want, they want to work on. They are able to choose with whom they want to work, and they are able to choose when they want to work, and so on. So it's really true self-managing work teams. People are really able to work on yeah what they want. They've got complete autonomy, 
And in the literature, we find the term I in Boltman work system, and it's proven to be very effective. And as an example, I've put uh, on some of my slides some IRC extracts, and these serve uh, two purposes. The first one is to keep you awake before lunch, and the second one is to give an idea for those developed, for those people who are not within the previous the organization. Uh, it gives you an example of what's the culture inside through BSD. <coughs> so you will see other IRC extracts like those ones. And yeah, do not try to recognize the logins here. I actually <laughs> actually changed them. Um, that was the first advice from Mr. Wolf. We're going to see the second one now. After the empowerment, uh, the next important value and yeah, force we need to stress on within an organization is the motivation of your workforce. And this is an important point as well because you will not motivate the same way um, if you are a knowledge worker, meaning uh, people working with knowledge, with ID to create new IDs and to try to be creative. Um, I got a model here, which is quite interesting, from Maslow, who calls it the pyramid of needs, and who explains that if you are a knowledge worker, you will be motivated by the highest levels of need in the pyramid. But to reach those higher levels of need, the lower ones must be fulfilled. So basically, the lower needs are the needs for survival and for safety, um, which means that if you don't have food, if you are hungry, if you don't sleep enough, or, and so on, you wouldn't be able to focus and concentrate on something else. So those are the basic needs that need to be fulfilled. But once those needs are fulfilled, um, you get higher needs like self-esteem and self-actualization. Uh, self-esteem is something that you feel um, you need to have your work recognized, you need to have good feedback from your peers, and you need to feel that your work is interesting to other people. And I remember uh, when doing my PhD, uh, I was working in the laboratory, and people there were not that much interested in money, what they wanted is that they um, wanted to have their article published, they wanted to go to conferences, to meet peers and to exchange ideas and to uh, know that their work was recognized by their peers was very important. So that's the kind of need from working um, or uh, from knowledge workers, sorry. <coughs> And the last one, which is of interest here, is the need for self-actualization. You need, basically, to learn new things every day, to face challenging issues, and to um, realize that you grow as a person every day. And this is done by yeah, either working on difficult uh, topics, or by exchanging with other developers, Basically, you realize it's really important to you to learn something every day. And Nuke uh, realizes that at FreeBSD, we are able to do that. Uh, this need for self-actualization is something that can be fulfilled within the FreeBSD environment, because uh, we see that today we can exchange with other people, and uh, we are able to work on very challenging issues, uh, mainly research topics, something that had never been done before. So this is very important to motivate uh, uh, people to be creative. You have within your organization to uh, spare some time for, for your employees so that they are able to uh, exchange ideas and to talk together so you must not blame them if they spend time in front of the coffee machine, for example, because uh, it could be there that the innovation comes from. Uh, the third uh, advice from Mr. Wolf. That's an important point as well, um, is that you must not reinvent the wheel all the time. And in the literature, uh, guys, Cole Peters says that you have to put the 
NIH syndrome, the not invented here syndrome behind you, and uh, learn to copy from the best. Of course, to not to copy blindly what others do, but to improve, to adapt to your own products and so on. And this leads to the PFE, the probably found elsewhere. And actually, it, uh, studies show that creative sweeping, it's how we call the fact that we look at what others do and we bring their best ideas within our own organization, it greatly improves the rate of innovation within a company. And on the next slide, thinking about it again, Noob starts to realize that at 3BSD we absolutely do not have the NIH syndrome. And here I listed some of the products that were brought to 3BSD but that did not originally um, were invented there. Uh, yeah, PF from OpenPSD, for example, which is one of the best firewall out there, and other uh, different um, uh, software and components that we integrated into FreeBSD, making it um, really an innovative system as a whole, because we are able to bring the best from other products and to integrate it into our system. So this is very important, the creative sweeping and trying to avoid the NIH syndrome. And this NIH syndrome is something that um, I've experienced in my previous companies. Uh, sometimes people say that, okay, then they are doing this uh, product and why wouldn't we reuse it? But they said, okay, but uh, those guys are really bad developers and we can do much better, so let's start to rewrite it from scratch and we're going to build something really nice. And in the end, uh, we realized that six months later we were not even able to do the same thing and we lost a lot of time and it's, it's really bad. So. Really, the PFA probably found elsewhere is a way to really increase your creativity. And last part of the culture um, is the playfulness, which is very important as well. Uh, Mr. Wolf says that you must not forget to have fun. Because when you evolve in a playful environment, you are able to more easily talk with others. I mean, you don't fear. Um, if you have crazy ideas, if you come with crazy ideas to solve an issue, if you work in kind of bureaucracy with really rigid minds and stuff like that, you would fear um, explaining your crazy ideas because uh, you would fear that the guy would look at you like, wow, what is he talking to me about? It's not the way we do things here and it's really uh, not easy to progress and to, do, uh, to um, expose your crazy innovative ideas in an, um, in an environment which is not um, uh, yeah, where you don't have a playful environment and the IRC quotes I put on my slides I hope it shows that uh, the playful environment we have it at FreeBSD and we do not fear to expose our crazy ideas and this definitely helps bringing innovation in a faster way. So that was the first part related to culture and now I want to talk about the structure uh, within an organization because um, those concepts are clearly uh, related and um, putting, setting up some kind of structure, some kind of specific structures in organization is sometimes really helpful to make people uh, feel more creative. So what's the structure? Uh, I like this quote from Minsberg, who says that the structure follows the strategy as the left foot follows the right. It means that structure and strategies are closely linked together. And if you want to put a strategy that's clearly focused on innovation, 
you will have to put uh, the structure that corresponds to this strategy. And usually we hear that companies whose core business is innovation, like big IT companies, uh, you've got um, specific structures within them. Those companies do not uh, look like other companies, and that's what we are going to see now. So the first um, advice from Wolf is with regards to structure, uh, you've got to let your people organize their work themselves. And this idea goes back to the empowerment we saw earlier with the culture um, and to the Senko company we saw. Basically, the CIO seller says that um, the standard policy at Senko is no policy, meaning that he does not want to put posters on his wall uh, stating the core values of the company because he does prefer having uh, his employees behave the, more, the way they want to. Um, he promotes autonomy and the diversity, meaning that people um, in such companies are able to organize their day-to-day -day work. They are able to organize their office, they are able to um, say, uh, okay, I want to work in this office with this person and so on. So it's not rigid at all. And you've got more freedom to organize your work. So that's the self-organization. And closely related to this concept, you have the natural system. The natural system is a collectivity whose participants uh, share a common interest in the survival of the system. Like FreeBSD developers sharing a common interest in maintaining FreeBSD as a top-notch system. And those participants, they engage in collective activities to secure the system they love. And <coughs> that means that with regards to the structure, you will have an informal structure because you recognize that um, your people have different interests, so you let them organize themselves depending on the interest they have, and if they feel that other uh, people share common interests with them, then um, you let them form a team so they are able to work uh, together and uh, it's interesting to note as well that such natural system they evolve depending on changes in internal and external environments but they do not involve a following strict strategies and basically that's what happened with FreeBSD because um, we evolve depending on the number of developers that uh, join the project. Uh, we evolve depending on uh, what kind of interest if people want to work on uh, redesigning a linker, for example, or something else, then the project itself will move in the direction that are set by um, the people they, who engage in those informal collective activities. Yeah, I've been talking about natural system, and I believe that FreeBSD is a natural system in a way that we find in the business literature. Because we've got a segmentation of work um, that's um, linked to the different comic bit types uh, we have at FreeBSD. People are interested in working on documentation only, people are interested in porting application to the system and basically those people gather together to work on specific parts but they are not told on which part they have to work. So it's really um, natural organization and people have the freedom to uh, work on whatever, yeah, whatever subject they want. So that was the natural system. and. On the next slide, um, this is related to the creative sweeping we saw earlier. People uh, are looking at what's done elsewhere and try to bring the best 
IDs within the organization. And there are things to do to favor uh, this creative sweeping, which is turned in the literature, the boundary spanning. And Nubel showed that the more boundary spanners you have within your organization, the higher its degree of innovativeness. And basically, in some companies, um, yeah, I don't know if you apply for Google already, but uh, in those kind of companies, they ask you if you are part of an open source project as well. And this has different interests. Um, the first one, I guess, is to um, see if you have the technical competencies and if uh, they, well, they want to know on which technology you work on. But the other point, I guess, is that they want to know if you are a boundary spanner or not. Because if you are part of an open source project, it means that during your spare time you are interested in exchanging ideas with other people. And you, in that case, um, you are a boundary spanner. Because during your spare time, you will continue working on this project. And as Newell states, the more boundary spanners you have within your organization, the more creativity your people will be. So it's very interesting for those IT companies to know if you will be working um, on your developments only during your work hours, or if you will do it as well at home with other people and with other communities because then you would be able to bring ideas within the organization you apply to. And um, structurally speaking, you can set up uh, some things to help in this boundary spanning. Um, again, at Google, you have some free time to work on the projects you want. Um, in one of my previous companies, uh, there was the same system meaning we were able to work for four hours a week on a topic that interested us and we were able to choose what topic we wanted to work on and this really um, was helpful to try to find new ideas to allow us to give time for uh, this research and it was very interesting the way it was done and I really believe, from my own experience, that boundary spending is an important point to focus on if you want your people to be creative. And <coughs> the next slide. I believe that um, at FreeBSD we are all boundary spanners because either we are students or we have um, official jobs. And in those official jobs, we are able to exchange with other engineers or we are able to keep pace of the latest developments in technologies and this facilitates the inward flow of information um, within FreeBSD. We take information from the outside world to FreeBSD itself and this helps having good ideas. And somewhat, sometimes it's just uh, that in our official jobs we see how we should not do things and we uh, see that things go wrong and then when we go back to FreeBSD we are able to say okay this is not the way we should do, let's do it another way and that greatly helps I guess the innovation within FreeBSD, the fact that we are all boundary spanners. And um, next point with regards to the structure. Yeah. Um, the virtual teams. That's an important part as well. Um, Mr. Wolf says that you should try to make your company virtual or at least facilitate people who want to work for you um, to make it virtual. So basically virtual teams, it's uh, the way it is at FreeBSD, people rarely meet together, but instead work uh, at their own and they exchange using IT technologies. 
And usually, uh, virtual teams, they are able to work 24-7 because of the different time zones. Um, and it's a powerful way of working, except that uh, when it comes to management, uh, we all know that our manager uh, really uh, love to feel their power, and they like to see um, what we are working. They want to be able to see what's on our screen to make sure that we're not playing a game at work and stuff like that. And this kind of management disappears when you have virtual teams because of course they are not able to check what you're doing all the time. You're not in the same premises as your managers, so it makes things much more difficult. And actually, um, Story says that there are very few examples of companies in commercial work that manage to make a successful implementation of such teams. And on the next slide, um, I believe that 3PSD is really living proof that virtual teams can be um, can bring a great success to the organization. And here there's a map taken from this article showing uh, the number of lines of code that were produced um, uh, based on different places um, on Earth. And it really shows that FreeBSD is a virtual organization. And it's really nice to see that it's a project that's ongoing 24 7 and 365 days a year. The project basically never stops. And I remember several times I had questions I asked on IRC before going to bed, and the next morning I got my answer. And it's really helpful to make things go fast. And virtual team is something that uh, people still here at work, it's very difficult to make companies realize that it's a possible way of working and it's, it could be a very efficient one. We start seeing this, uh, especially in IT, with nearshoring or offshoring, but it's still difficult to make managers realize that it's a possible way of working. So I think it's a good example we have at FreeBSD and it's something we should advocate at our workplaces. It's, we can use it to show them that it really works. So that was um, it for the structure. And now, uh, on the next slide, I want to yeah, focus a bit more on FreeBSD because um, I, we've been hearing uh, some advices from Mr. Wolf and we've seen that at FreeBSD, uh, we have implemented quite a lot of those advices. And on the next slide, um, yeah, just to mention that those were only a few uh, points uh, that are related to the culture and the structure that we could set up within a company. But there are many more, many more points, but I didn't have much time to explain them all. So if you are interested by it, um, there's an article I published in BSD Maxim, the February issue, where you find more details about those points. So if you are interested, you can start with this article. But now, um, going back to FreeBSD, the question was uh, the structure and the culture we have in place at FreeBSD, does it really help being innovative for us? And I would say definitely yes. That's um, what FreeBSD is today. I've just mentioned <coughs> some of the products that we find in our system. And we recognize that some of them are part of the creative sweeping and boundary spanning we saw earlier, like PF, like ZFS. But some other are really projects that started within FreeBSD. Uh, we think about PI, our JLs, and lots of different products. And to me, FreeBSD is why I like the system. It's that we managed to build something that's really um, full of 
killer features and we manage it also thanks to the culture and the structure we have within FreeBSD. So I think it really helps. And the last thing I want to mention today is a quote from Kobe, which I find very enlightening. It's a quote taken from his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's one of the 25 most influential books in management, in management ever written, uh, based on the study from the Time magazine. And basically, Kobe says that you should treat your employees as volunteers, just as you treat your customers as volunteers, because that's what they are. They volunteer their best part, their art and minds. And that's where uh, the creativity comes from, from the art and minds of your employees. And I believe that if managers went to work every morning with this quote in mind, we would find much more creative products on the market. Because if you consider your employees as volunteers, basically you end up setting quite the same structure and culture as the one we find in FreeBSD because we are all volunteers there. So you would give more freedom to your people, you would let them organize their work the way they want to. And I'm sure from what we've seen so far that it will help in being more innovative. So that's basically it.